And I'm going to go ahead and post some links right now into the chat just so that people can click on links to Iowa OER and can find links as well to the Code of Best Practices. Okay. All right, everybody. I think there may be a few people still trickling in, but I'd like to welcome everyone who's here and those who are coming in to another Iowa OER webinar. We hold these um, webinars kind of semi-regularly, usually one or two a semester on topics related to OER, open ed, open pedagogy, and any other kind of adjacent topics that may be of interest to those in our state and beyond. So if you have topics of interest that you'd like to see covered in these webinars that we haven't covered so far, you can always send us a message to the Iowa OER Google group or through the Iowa OER website. We also have a contact form um, there as well. And I posted some contact information in the chat. So go ahead and reach out to us. Um, don't be a stranger if you'd like to get involved or if you'd like um, you know, any, any topics of interest to be brought up through these webinars or through the group. Today we are joined by guests Will Cross and Meredith Jacob, who um, Will is a medium-sized pile of diplomas in a trench coat. He serves as the Director of Open Knowledge Center at NC State University, is an instructor at UNC Chapel Hill, and is Senior Policy Fellow at American University's Washington College of Law. Will holds a degree from UNC Chapel Hill, where he also earned his MS in Library and Information Science, his MA in Media Law and Policy, and his BA in Constitutional History and Dramatic Art. His current research on harmonizing copyright literacy in open knowledge communities is supported by grants from the IMLS, the Hewlett Foundation, and lyricists. In 2023, he conducted research on copyright literacies in European open science communities as a Fulbright Schumann Innovation Fellow. Open education has tremendous potential to build tailored resources that reflect the diverse experiences of students and support transformative pet practices, but only when educators are empowered to draw on the most current and relevant materials. Reliance on copyright exceptions such as fair use and fair dealing is critical for creating the most effective and inclusive materials. This session introduces the Code of Best Practices and Fair Use for OER, a guide to reliance on fair use when building OER. I've dropped a link to the code in the chat, as I mentioned, and I really think this document is a must read for anyone who works in OER creation or adaptation. And after today's talk, I think you'll be able to see why. It's been incredible help for me personally, um, as I assist local authors and, you know, as they kind of work through whether or not to incorporate copyrighted material in their OER. And um, the presentation will last approximately 40 minutes, leaving plenty of time for discussion. And we do ask that you keep your mics muted during that time, but feel free to type your questions into the chat and we will get to them during the discussion. And I mentioned the recording will be, or I mean, sorry, the, the presentation will be recorded for sharing out and we'll try to get that posted to the Iowa OER YouTube channel sometime today or tomorrow. So I will now turn it over to Will. Thank you, Myra. And um, I think Meredith needs no introduction because she's so eminent. But Meredith, do you want to do a quick, a quick sort of let folks know who you are? Well, sadly, I have fewer degrees than Will Cross, so you probably shouldn't listen to me. But uh, I am at the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property in DC at American University's Law School, where I'm the director of their project on copyright and open licensing, which is what happens if you let lawyers write organization and job titles. It's all in the headings. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. But um, yeah, worked with Will on questions about copyright, fair use, open licensing, and how to help make that useful for folks in getting their professional work done. Oh, it looks like you're muted, Will. There we go. Thank you. So I, I'm, I'm sharing screen now, and I, I want to just underline what you said, which is that as a conversation, this is going to be much more interesting than if we just go through a bunch of slides. So we've got some foundational stuff to make sure we have sort of a shared vocabulary, but anytime we can break that into questions and real life scenarios and that kind of thing, that's, I think, all for the good. So Meredith, why don't you and I start out with a little bit of overview um, and then make sure to leave some space for questions at the end, but also welcome questions in chat throughout the process. Great. And I'm happy to, to start us out and talk. No. Yeah, no, sorry. I was just trying to make sure I didn't talk over you. So I think the first question that a lot of folks had ask is sort of why do we need fair use if we're already sort of operating in this separate OER space? And I think the answer that becomes clear after some work is that you can't make 
good OER as if it was a closed book test. Um, I can't see the folks here, so I can't estimate your ages, but I'm gonna guess if you're at least as old as I am, that you have taken those exams where you had the blue book, right? And you went in and did that, and that is not how we write um, good OER, that you need to engage in the world around you. And in fact, you know, six or seven years ago, when folks like Will and I were going to open ed and talking to folks creating OER, what we found is that the questions about um, the licenses themselves were actually pretty limited, right? People, after some work, understood how to put the licenses on, understood how to read them. But the questions were really about the sort of big outside world in which all these materials operated. Um, and to do that, to really understand that and understand what you could do, you needed to have some baseline understanding in copyright. Um, sorry, well, I think Will and I are doing these slightly out of order. Um, but to do that, we sort of talk about what copyright is and what fair use allows you to do and how it allows you to bring other outside things into, um, into the materials you're creating. And I think often what we get from folks is that that's perceived as risky of like that it's easier, even if it's more work to recreate something and put it into your textbook than it is to, um, to sort of go out and think through questions of fair use. But what Will and I have, have argued over the last couple of years is that there are some real risks that are unavoidable if you're not willing to sort of delve in and um, do the work to understand and rely on fair use. What is a significant cost to um, students with disabilities? That often fair use is the limit to copyright that you need to be able to go out and take existing materials and make an accessible copy to bring them into your materials instead of linking out. Um, we see a lot of risk with linking out that the, the things out there on the internet are not necessarily accessible. They don't meet the standards in your school and they can't be format shifted to meet the needs of all students. And so one of the things we see um, really disturbingly is often people saying, well, those are just ancillary or support materials. So it's okay if we're not in charge of their accessibility, which I feel like, of course, should be a red flag to us that we're providing an experience to students who have accessibility needs that is less than their peers. The other is mission risk. I think um, the moment that actually convinced me we had to do this best practices in fair use was talking to um, teachers and hearing about the ways in which they did this stuff. It was clearly bad for their pedagogical mission to try to sort of evade hard questions about copyright. And two that stood out were people who were writing um, literature questions, uh, like student activities and assessments for OER that had very carefully referred to like, open your book to page 25, line 14, this thing, read two paragraphs, and then respond to the sentence. And it was such um, sort of convoluted pedagogy instead of just using that paragraph in the assessment that you were, you were doing real harm to your teaching mission. Um, the other was hearing about people choosing sort of very dry government documents as reading assignments because they were sure they were in the public domain. And I was like, wait a second, like we need to do teaching first work here. We can't sort of tailor our teaching to a very low copyright risk without sort of ignoring the mission rich risk to that. Um, the other thing we saw, particularly during the pandemic, was that um, solutions that rely on linking out, that relied on um, uh, materials that were behind paywalls, things like that. Anything that made access harder, anything that relied on high quality internet all the time, uh, further burden marginalized students, further burden students who might not be always accessing material on the same device, who might be borrowing a computer at a library or using a phone or a tablet instead of a laptop. Um, and that finally, that if you only rely on open sources, that you get a sort of skewed set of perspectives by what is represented only in those sources and not in other sort of broader cultural resources. Next slide, please. Um, 
Another very specific risk is that you end up using old stuff, right? We find folks um, really over relying on things that are in the public domain due to age. Um, and so picking stuff that is less relevant to students because it feels lower risk from a copyright standpoint, when in fact, a lot of modern materials that are really sort of popular and compelling are available for teaching and learning exactly because fair use allows those transformative purposes. And so one specific uh, risk is talking about coming up with things that are sort of disassociated from um, the things that, that students actually experience. Um, and here is an example of, you know, if you want to teach about questions of revolving around protest or about current events, that um, you don't want to tell the story based only on what photos happen to be available, for example, in Wikimedia Commons. Um, one example of this that uh, is definitely a, a little bit of a hot topic, but like, you know, when we think about conflict and war, very often, like historically, the photographs we have of war are photographs from photographers employed or embedded with the military. And I think you could make a really good argument that like, that is also not a representative way to just choose photographs that are in the public domain rather than news photographs. So like what sources end up in the open or public domain space is there. So that brings us to the question of how to understand and use fair use. Like we don't think people avoid relying on fair use because it is just a preference, but I think because it can seem like risky and complicated to undertake. And so because of that, we've relied on a strategy of creating best practices in fair use. And what these are is they're documents that we've created in partnership with different types of creative and professional communities over the past 20 years to help understand the shared cases that come up in their work and how to analyze those cases sort of reliably and predictably in a fair use framework. So I'm sure everybody here has heard about fair use, but there's two core questions, which is one, are you doing something new or different, something transformative with that material? And is the amount you're using, whether the part or the whole appropriate? But when we talk to educators, we think there's often uh, actually sort of a question zero, which is what pedagogically are you, do are you doing? Because you can't answer that question there that's labeled number one, are you doing something different or transformative if you haven't enunciated what you are doing? And so in practice, when we sit down with ed educators, what we're often asking is, what pedagogical purpose are you using this for? And we're not asking, are you using this for an educational purpose? We're asking like very, very specifically, like if you were explaining this to another teacher in your discipline, but why you picked this example specifically, because it was a good example. Why did you do that? And so you might say, I'm using this popular media article because it's actually talking about a political conflict that we've heard about from the American Revolutionary War to the Civil War to whatever. And so I picked this popular media thing because it sort of shows that this question about whatever topic isn't actually a new one. That's your pedagogical purpose, right? That's your question zero. Then you go to question one, which is, is this something new or different? Are they doing something transformative? And to answer that question, you can say, no, here's this reason this was published. Here's this different pedagogical thing I'm doing. And then are you using the right amount? So that's how you think through fair use. But in practice, it's often easier to use a tool like the best practices to sort of routinize and to take that more abstract question and ground it in the types of work that you see over and over again. So as I said, we've done a bunch of best practices over the last couple decades. The first one was one with documentary filmmakers. What they were finding was in a lot of documentary film, you capture incidental stuff, clips of music, billboards, um, art, other images, things that are protected by copyright but that fair use allows you to do that. And what was happening is documentary filmmakers were struggling to get clearance to release those films. And this code of best practices helped them form a framework that said, okay, if we followed the code, we're doing these regular things, 
we're in a position that's low risk and that's aligned with our professional mission and we feel comfortable doing that. And so that's what we've done here is tried to work through a process of interviews and focus groups to see which cases come up over and over again. What are the things you need to think about in those specific cases from your fair use analysis? And how to write a guidance document that lets people move forward in not every single case, but in the vast majority of cases with a little more guidance than just looking at those two legal questions in the areas that we see in high frequency in the creation and use of OER. So here's the full uh, spectrum of the codes. I think the ones that have been used a lot, particularly, are the best practices and fair use for OER. The first one, which was the Documentary Filmmakers Code and the Code for Fair Use in Academic and Research Libraries. But what I will say is these principles are not sort of cabined to one subject matter. And so if, for example, you were working in an English literature class, you might find information that was meaningful in the Code of Best Practices and Fair Use for Poetry. There's one for the uh, visual arts. And so I would encourage people to work sort of between the codes if that is something that is useful to them. And one of the things that I think is important to address is for a lot of folks, this is a big change in practice. When we started working with the OER community, I think in part because educators have always worked so carefully to be clear about um, professional topics like attribution and plagiarism, that that is sort of translated into a hyper caution about the economic and legal questions that are separately contained in copyright and fair use. And that over caution has made a lot of what we are telling people feel like a very big and radical change. And in fact, um, in, the, in the counter, at the outset of this project, I had a really hard time convincing law professors that these were even questions. They were like, why do we need to do this code? Everybody knows they can do that. And so two things are true about this code. It's a big step and a big change and really hard sort of movement for a lot of folks in the OER community. And it is really legally very centrist. Um, that it is not operating at all at sort of the margins of how we understand fair use. When you hear about cases um, about copyright and fair use, some of you may have heard of the most recent decision about the Internet Archive controlled digital lending, um, the Warhol case about the photograph of prints, cases like that. Those are cases that are at the sort of borderlands, at the very edges of what we know. And almost everything that's in this code is really in the center of the stuff that is settled practice about being fair use, but that is still a big change in practice for the OER community. And so the code came out of a series of interviews and workshops, and then we separately sent it out to be reviewed by, I think, five or six different um, copyright law professors and practitioners who were not a part of our drafting. So for whom this was not their baby, they had not carefully drafted it. And we said, be critical. Like, we want this to be something that is not an advocacy document, that is really a practical document for what the law is right now and to how to make reliable decisions in your professional work. And so they all reviewed it and critiqued it. And if anything, often pushed back and said, I think you can do more. But I think it was important that the document represented the experiences of the people working in OERs and in, in OER and in libraries. And so, there certainly are things that you can do that are not encompassed in the code. The code is not a limit. The code is a baseline of which practices we had consensus and clear guidance about. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Will and that Will walk you through the code and the principles within. Thank you, Meredith, for that, that excellent overview. Um, so, that, so that's sort of the, the reason for the code and the work that was done to create the code. Um, we're excited to talk some about what the code says itself, but I really want to underline two things that Meredith said about the code. First, that it does not represent sort of the outer limit or the, the most aggressive, dangerous, risk-taking thing you can do. It is the very center of the map. So as we talk about the code, we're going to talk about this idea that um, it describes a set of use cases, things that educators told us they wanted to do and were the sort of things a good educator could do. We articulate that as a principle. 
And then we talk about some considerations for use, you know, how do I, how do I think about this if I'm moving away from the very dead center of the map and in towards the sort of outer concentric circles of still center of the map. And then we went a little further and talked about some hard cases as well, these sort of outer limits that if you go beyond what the code says is absolutely clearly fine, and even beyond things the code says, well, that's probably okay, but make sure you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's and moving into the truly hard cases, you know, really, really think more carefully about that piece as well. So, so this idea that this is not a, not a ceiling on your practice, just a floor is really, really significant. And Meredith, please jump in. Well, I wanted to um, reward people following our desperate plea to ask questions so that our pedagogy isn't so bad. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and... So um, Abby had asked, can you give an example of a hard case? And um, we'll talk about some hard cases for each principle. Um, but before we get into that, I want to sort of say what hard cases are. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, so maybe we can jump into the next principle just to show that as an example. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So, Will, do you want to introduce this one that we can talk about the hard case? Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is a nice example. The, the first principle that the code lays out is the opportunity to use inserts as objects of criticism or commentary. So the example that we have here is if we're doing a class that's focused on poetry, you could bring in an, an existing poem and give your either do the critique yourself. Here's an example of this sort of poem. Here's how it does a good job. Here's how it could have done a better job, etc. Or you could invite your students and say, this is an example of a poem in a particular style. The assignment we're giving to you is to do critique or commentary on that poem. Ah, this use of a repeated phrase is common in the genre for this reason. Or, ah, this is kind of a clumsy rhyme that, that's a little overdetermined. They could have done a better job here. So that's a nice example of, of the first principle that we sometimes talk about. And I should say it was, the, I think, the one that came up as often as any and seemed most common sense to educators. That, of course, in education, what you do is you look at the things you're studying and you critique them or you analyze them in different ways. So it, it, it's first, both because it's that's just how we laid it out, but also because it's a it's a, a common recurrence and a clear slam dunk fair use case as well. Meredith, did you want to jump in? Yeah. Well, and so I'm going to, um, I won't, I don't want to share my screen in this moment just because I don't want to. Um, we can up. jump into the code if you want. Can I? Yeah, please do. So I'll, I, I can do that. Well, we'll see if I can do that here. So we'll stop share for a second. We will escape on out. We will reshare again. Thank you for this question. It's going to be a good one. Um, and so I have the code up here. Does that work for you, Will? Yep. So I've got the code here, or would you rather take over? I think I'm sharing. OK, I think I'm sharing, but I will stop sharing and let you share. OK. Maybe we are both. Perfect. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Okay. Meredith has, so, has pulled it out here to show. In the code, we have principles, considerations, and hard cases. So the first principle is using inserts as objects of criticism and commentary. And we have the description of what we mean. They could be a uh, full, it could be a poem, it could be a photo, it could be an excerpt from a novel, it could be part of a scientific article. And it's a, using it for critique or commentary where you're directly addressing it. And we have some considerations for that. It says that they should be things that are being directly examined, that they are um, the correct amount, that you use different sources if that aligns with your pedagogy. Obviously, if you were examining a single author, you would use things from that author. So not, these are just, these are not hard rules, they're just considerations and that you should provide attribution. The hard case we saw here was that, um, well, you can obviously embed things into your OER um, for the purpose of criticism. People often sort of ask about or wanted to explore around the edges of basically creating things that looked more like a freestanding OER anthology. And, this is a practice where it would really come down, I think, to how much the curation and sort of selection and arrangement 
of those pieces in the anthology were curated, it might come down to sort of what types of resources they were themselves. Were these fiction short stories that were often sort of sold in similar anthologies, or were they materials across a lot of different types that were being juxtaposed? We also have a lot of questions in this space about creating online sort of object libraries for student exploration and selection. And in those situations, it's going to come down a lot to sort of how tight your curation is, how different the criticism is from the sort of general appreciation and uh, purpose of those materials. So I think, for example, if I were doing the fair use analysis, I might have an easier time with like a anthology style library or online tool about historical journalism than I would about fiction short stories because the different purpose is stronger in one than the other. I don't know that that's true at that specific example, but those are the hard cases where you don't have a lot of text, like new OER text or context around the resource and where there's sort of more bare in an anthology or library. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great way to put it. That sometimes it's it's about how clearly and explicitly your your pedagogical hand is on the steering wheel in a way that an outside observer can understand. Um, um, another hard case, just to show that um, in a future thing we'll talk about is um, we talk about using uh, different things for illustration, and as we'll talk about in those slides. What we mean is to sort of illustrate an idea or a point, um, but it's a harder fair use case if what you're doing is stuff that is sort of more distantly related to the thing you're teaching, where it's like general illustration meant to sort of set a scene, but isn't particularly tightly linked to what is being, teach to being taught. Um, so that's an idea of the hard cases. Does that help answer your question? Does anyone else? We'll yeah. go through the examples, then maybe we'll um, switch over and jump in to sort of specific hard cases that still feel like they are standing out to folks. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's one other question that maybe we can answer now, and the question is about dealing with a, a gatekeeper or a decision maker like general counsel who may be a little more skeptical of of aggressive use of fair use. I, I, they talked about it in terms of legal counsel may differ quite a lot in how much they encourage the campus community to take advantage of fair use. Um, and I'll say that when Meredith showed you that list of noted luminaries that reviewed our document, we were very, very careful to include Steve McDonald, who is the head of NACUA, which is essentially the professional organization for general councils. So I think we've had some cases where a council might say, is, is this document legit? And it's, well, Steve says it's pretty good. And it, oh, oh, of course, well, if Steve says it's pretty good, I'm, I better take a closer look. So. Um, the, we hope the, the process itself provides some reassurance. We hope the, the smart people outside of ourselves who have reviewed it and said it's appropriate helps make it easier to sort of explain why it's, why it's valuable. Um, and then over time, I think seeing more and more people use it is going to make it feel safer as well. Something that I run into a lot in my own library work is it's often hard to be the first person to do something, but once you can point to a few peer institutions and say, ah, oh, well, but they're doing it and they're doing it and they're doing it, that can make it easier to, to contextualize, especially for counsel where their concern is not, I know the law inside and out in terms of copyright, and I think you're wrong. It's like, I don't know as much about copyright, but I don't want to step out on the what might feel like thin ice. So we, yeah, Mary, good. The other thing I will say, um... And I'm trying to figure out how to, how to phrase this in a way that's like useful and responsible. Your general counsel's very strict job is to reduce risk, legal risk of all types for your university. And I think that if you are doing something that is really different and really big and really novel, it is important to talk to your general counsel, right? You're going to host a big new open textbook library. You're going to do whatever. In the same way that you were, if you were going to establish a college, uh, a new college like skydiving team, you would probably talk to them. Um, and at the same time, you know, if you are a field hockey coach, every time that you introduce a different drill with moderately different physical risk, 
that you're like, nope, I'm a coach. This is a good part of my normal work. This is what we do. You don't send them an email that's like, hey, we're going to do this new, slightly more dangerous drill. Will you really totally calm with that? Because like their job is to be like, don't do anything. At some level, their job is don't do too much new. And so I think you don't want to like ignore your general counsel. Obviously, listen to your general counsel. They're really important. But the core decisions that you need to make here are not ones that they are particularly well suited to decide because it is, what is your pedagogical purpose? Like, it's actually really hard even for librarians to do that, I think, for professors, because if you don't have a really good grasp of why this is the right thing and what pedagogical work it's doing in the OER, it's actually hard for you to make a good decision about whether or not it's fair use. Does that yep. seem fair, Will? It does, absolutely. I've heard you in the past use the example of chemistry classes that we let 14-year-olds use Bunsen burners. And that's just, that, you know, we need to learn chemistry. And, and in theory, somebody could burn their hand, but we just accept that that's part of the process. Well, and, you know, like no one, no one ever has to go to the hospital because of copyright, uh, <laughs> as opposed to the large range of other things that go on at both K-12 and higher education institutions. Yep. The rate of copyright-related um, loss of quality-adjusted life years Remarkably low. Um, and so I would say, yes, absolutely. For big new areas of work, talk to the right people, talk to your gatekeepers, talk to whatever. For others, I will say that having your answers about why this is really clearly pedagogically useful and clearly different, those are the answers they should need. Um, and we do know this is a big need and it's why we continue to look for ways to engage with the general counsel community to help this feel reliable. Excellent. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm conscious that we're at 1.30 and we promised you 20 minutes of open questions. So maybe we can zip through the four principles uh, pretty quickly, get into some specific examples, and then open it up for some more of these really excellent questions, which, as predicted, have been the best part of the conversation so far. So I'm going to go ahead and quickly share screen here. Um, so Meredith did a really nice job of walking us through the structure that we're going to use, use case, principle, consideration, and hard case. Uh, we talked briefly about the that first principle of using inserts as objects of criticism and commentary. And then Meredith, you also pointed to the idea of including inserts for the purposes of illustration, which is sort of a, a cousin to, but not exactly the same thing as critique or commentary. Um, so the example that we like to use here is if I were writing a textbook about costume design in film over the years, um, it might be useful to illustrate, well, when we present robots historically, we've done certain things consistently. So here's an image from the 1927 film Metropolis. Here's their presentation of a robot, and here, then here's a 1977 version as well. We're not like critiquing the, the making or asking them, you know, did, were, are these good or bad robots or how did their costume design work? We're just saying this is an illustration of the way we often use costumes to present robots in different ways. Um, and as with the critique that we talked about above, this was both something we heard a lot of, a lot of educators saying that they do do and they felt like they ought to be able to do because this is what good pedagogy looks like as meredith said and um as a, as lawyers we knew and when we talked to our outside experts they agreed of course inclusion for illustration is is a core purpose that fair use is designed to support meredith did you want to add some context there uh no i got a call from my partner who was locked out of our house but he's figured it out <laughs> totally so fair not adding context okay <laughs> excellent <laughs> um so commentary and critique illustration to core pedagogical purposes that the law clearly supports and that the code sort of talks you through how to engage with in different ways. The third example that we heard about was one that I found really, really interesting. It had to do with incorporating content explicitly as learning resource materials. So the example we heard was, I want to teach people about Spanish and how to learn to speak Spanish. And I can give them the sort of textbook generated, um, you know, hello, my name is such and such, and I went to the biblioteca or whatever. But I really want them to learn the language as it's actually spoken in the world. Is it okay to show them something like a telenovela? To just put on the screen, here are the ways people speak casually in different contexts with different sorts of people. Can I just bring that in and show students an episode of that telenovela? And the answer, of course, is, is yes, it's in the code, so no surprise, right? Um, but that, that, again, is the sort of thing that fair use is designed to do, to take in something that was designed for the original purpose of creating an entertaining show. The transformative purpose is using it as a learning resource material to help demonstrate in an authentic way how the language is spoken. 
that was another one that, that we heard a lot of really interesting examples about and that from a, from a purely copyright standpoint is pretty much right down the middle. The fourth example that the code talks about is, is sort of a, an oddball. Um, it has to do with repurposing content from existing educational materials. Uh, and this is in some sense a, a don't reinvent the wheel question. Um, but it's one that, that lies very close to one of the, the great no-nos that we talk about with copyright, right? Sometimes you get the question in OER, can I just take two really good all rights reserved textbooks and smush them together? And I'm like, no, the answer is no, that's not a transformative use, that's using a textbook as a textbook. But there are several different spaces where you can take some materials from existing educational content and then bring it into new OER. And we have a couple of examples here on the screen. The first is the verb tenses chart on the right. Um, copyright, of course, doesn't protect ideas, facts, concepts, etc. So if what you are borrowing is material that is not in and of itself copyrightable, like uh, Spanish verb tenses, then of course you're free to include that stuff because there's no copyright in the first place. Copyright doesn't protect a moa mas amat or whatever it is, right? And the same thing is often going to be true with uh, the structure and design of a textbook, the headings that are used. If I'm teaching a history of the 20th century and I start with 1900 and then we cover World War I and go down from there, nobody owns that, that selection or that, that um, way of, of bringing together the materials in different ways. So there, there are sort of high level unprotectable elements that can absolutely be included. In addition to that, when you are dealing with educational materials that are out of circulation, out of print, but maybe still in copyright, there are opportunities to use those existing sort of out of commerce educational works in a way that brings them into your new OER. Um, so I like this example on the left here, uh, a modern nuclear technology book from clearly the 1960s or early 70s based on the cover there. Um, I definitely don't want my students to learn about modern nuclear technology from a book written in the 1970s. Things might have changed since then. But if there are aspects of that book that are still relevant, but the book itself has passed out of commerce, there are some opportunities to include that as well. Um, we could we could say more about all of these, but I do want to leave space for questions. So um, I wanted to mention a couple of other aspects of the code and then talk a little bit about some of the pedagogical opportunities that we've seen. Um, so briefly, the code, if you were to synthesize the things that we that we saw in those interviews and that we've reflected in the code, um, a recognition that attribution is really critical. That was maybe Meredith, the number one thing we heard people talking about in some sense was, well, yeah, but you've got to do citation right. And the answer, as you all know, is you absolutely have an ethical and professional obligation to provide citation, but that is not a legal issue, that is an ethical issue. So it's fair use to do doesn't mean, and therefore I don't have to do normal disciplinary citation stuff. You still have all of your ethical obligations as well. Um, we heard a lot of conversation about fair use as a tool for equity and empowered pedagogy for the opportunity to do as Meredith talked about earlier, to, to bring new voices into the space and new examples, to invoke more current examples and media and materials that might not be openly licensed. Um, so fair use as a tool for making that uh, possible. Meredith also talked really thoughtfully about sort of the limitations of linking out and the value of fair use as a tool for accessibility. Um, some of the greatest fair use wins that I bet we're all familiar with have, to, have had to do with that question. Can I scan this to meet accessibility needs? Can I do that sort of thing? And when you're doing work to make educational materials accessible, fair use looms incredibly largely in that space. Um, Something the code does recommend that you do is you mark your instances of fair use. One of the signal virtues of open education in particular, of course, is the ability to revise, remix, and sort of pass downstream to other users who customize it themselves and pass it down to a third person who customize it and customizes it in their own way, etc. And so it's really, really important when you're including materials that are included under fair use that you say, this book is openly licensed under CC BY, but these specific materials were included under different terms, so nobody is surprised or, you know, sort of caught off guard by the inclusion of, of these materials for a different reason. Um, it is the case, of course, that fair use might look different downstream, but where the uses are fairly similar, where I'm using something to illustrate a point, and then you create a new textbook that is similarly being used to illustrate a point, the fair use analysis is going to look pretty similar as you move downstream um, with an obligation for each person to make their own fair use determination, of course. Um, 
how you mark those fair use inclusions is going to look really different in different contexts. Um, but of course, we already have a, a fairly large body of practices in terms of how to mark stuff. Um, so if I am including a single sentence that was written by somebody else in quotation marks, I probably didn't get permission to do that. I'm probably relying on fair use. And I don't have to put after every sentence in quotation marks, this sentence used under fair use as described in such and such. That would get pretty silly pretty quickly, right? Um, but where I'm including, you know, five pages of high quality images, and I'm doing that for critique and commentary, it might be useful to have at the bottom of the page, these images included under fair use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think we heard a lot of folks say that they like the idea of linking the fair use statement to the Creative Commons statement to say very clearly, if you want to know what's up with copyright, go here. This is the author. This is the CC license it's available by. And then here are the sort of the, the fair use discussion as well. But that's going to vary from discipline to discipline, from medium to medium, and so forth. And then finally, and very briefly, there are a set of appendices that, that I think have been really, really valuable for folks. Um, there's some, there's a general overview um, sort of showing you what we found in our conversations. There's a nice quick recap of fair use law that if you have to quickly do a presentation on fair use is maybe a nice resource to tap into. Um, one of the other major conversations that we had with folks had to do with, okay, fair use is American law, but what if I'm in Canada? What if I'm in Brazil? What if I'm in Australia? Does that mean I can't rely on the code anymore? Um, and so we spend some time talking through the fact that because there's this thing called the Berne Convention that has harmonized a lot of our international copyright laws, there is a, a general expectation that any copyright law that exists in a country that is a signatory to Berne, and that's most of them, is going to have some form of uh, generally called a quotation exception. That is not going to look exactly like fair use. We do it in 17 USC 107 in the United States. They do it in section 22 in Canada. They do it in a different way in the UK, etc. But that most to all areas of copyright law are going to have some version of that quotation right. So the code, although written with a US perspective, is generally going to be applicable around the world. And in particular, we got our good friend Karis Craig to write a very nice statement about those commonalities in the context of the US and Canada, because we know those communities work together so tightly so often. And Karis said better than we could uh, exactly what I said haltingly, which is that US and Canadian law use fair use or fair dealing, different slight language to get to the same underlying result. Educators should be able to use quotations of existing materials, be they text or movies or music or whatever in a way uh, particularly that is transformative, that is guided by a pedagogical need rather than just a sort of, that's a fun song, let's listen to it, need. Um, and then we also do a very quick explainer on trademark and patent and some of those other sort of cousin rights that essentially the punchline is they are unlikely to get in the way of your education. But if anybody ever says, oh my gosh, what about trademark here? There's a resource to point to that stuff as well. Um, I'm conscious that we're a little after 140, so I'm going to very quickly talk through these three opportunities. Meredith, feel free to add context and do my best to leave at least 15 minutes for some good questions and discussion. Um, so we released the code a couple of years ago, and since then, a lot of our work has been implementing the code in particular contexts and working with educators to go from the high level, it's probably fair use to do that sort of thing, into, okay, what does it look like in this particular context? And we wanted to point to three examples that that were striking to us in different ways. Uh, the first is that we uh, we worked with with uh, wonderful OER people Amber Hoy and Shannon Smith on some language learning stuff, and they shared this example with us that I go back to a lot that I really really value. They said when we're doing language learning, we would like to take this scene from a movie about an English te or a teacher walking to school going up the stairs and greeting their colleagues. And what happens in this video is they're walking along the street, they say hi to a friend, they walk in the building and there's a, there's a worker in the space that they greet in that way. And then they say hi to several different professional colleagues that they have different relationships with. And the way they say hi is different to each of those people. The word in French for hello stranger I almost bumped into on the street is different than the word for hello person working in the building where there's sort of consciousness about work roles is different than, than the way you say hi to your best friend. And I love this example because it's a really nice example of this is a video from a, from a, a movie that's out there in the world that is absolutely fair use to include because you're using it to illustrate this specific concept that we use greetings in different ways. So a really nice example of incorporating 
this piece of media in order to illustrate a concept that they're teaching in a way that feels authentic and interesting. The second example, I know Meredith is one that's that's stuck with you a lot. Do you want to introduce it or would you rather I keep the momentum going? Sure, I'll talk about it. Um, so this is a class uh, in high school in uh, Maine's online school system that uh, looks at the children's book, like a book that is below sort of grade level for their regular work called Henry Hikes to Fitchburg. And um, Henry Hikes uh, to Fitchburg is a, a sort of children's analogy to or reference to um, on Walden Pond, if I'm remembering their example correctly. And they go through and they say, hey, can you can you read this children's book? And I think maybe even listen to this read aloud on YouTube and pick out the um, situations that have themes from Thoreau. Like what are the ways that themes from Thoreau show up in this book? And this is one of the reasons that we always do workshops and focus groups that you cannot write the code in your own office. Because we were going through and sort of asking questions. We we're like, so... Like, why is the whole book the right amount? Like, let's think through that. And the thing person said was like one of those answers that will just be in your mind forever. And she was like, well, if the work the students are doing is picking out where the Thoreau examples are in this book, they have to have the whole book because if we kind of tend to the examples, the core pedagogical work of finding them doesn't work, right? And it was just like such a clear explanation of why that was. And it's having that clear pedagogy in your head that you should focus on. People get way too oriented towards trying to structure a legal argument that sounds like a legal argument. And that's mostly a waste of time. Like what you wanna have is a super clear pedagogical argument and explanation of why that is different than whatever this was created for the first point. That is the work you should focus on. And conveniently, it's the work that professors are best suited to do. You understand the pedagogy. You understand the nuance of why this is a good example or a good resource. And so focus on enunciating that because that is the work. Um, Will, do you wanna answer this and then go to the questions? Yeah, absolutely. So so just quickly, the, the other thing we've been doing over the past few months is talking to people about how AI fits in with the open education space. And one example we heard that I really like is uh, having a, a what would be sort of a final exam question, having AI answer it, and then making the assignment be the students critique the AI answer, right? You're going to demonstrate your mastery not by writing something from scratch, but by getting a pretty mid to bad answer from the tool and then explaining what it gets right, what it gets wrong, etc. Um, that's a really nice way to have students demonstrate their understanding. It's a really nice way to introduce a level of criticality to AI as a tool that some students might not have. They might just say, oh, there's an answer. It must be right. Um, and it's a nice way to talk about how fair use can often flatten a lot of seemingly complicated legal issues. Um, the copyright status of AI generated works right now is hotly debated in different ways. Um, but with fair use, you can sort of iron out all, all that and say, I don't care who the author was. I don't care if the Copyright Office is going to register that or not. It's fair use to do this sort of transformative piece. So hooray, I can I can do the teaching I need to do, which get back, gets back to Meredith's core point, which is like, start with the pedagogy, do the best pedagogy possible. And the purpose of the code is to get the law out of the way as appropriate to let you focus on the teaching questions and choose the best materials for your students and for your own pedagogy, rather than getting hung up on like, well, but some lawyer thinks whatever. That's that's the core, I think, purpose of the code. So that was um, a little longer than 40 minutes, but we still have a little over 10 minutes left. We're happy to answer questions, um, dig into specific principles more, et cetera. I'm gonna go ahead and stop share so that we can talk to each other. Um, I see some comments in chat that I'll read now, but but please add questions to the chat or unmute if you're more comfortable. So we have a, a question about territoriality and about sort of um, what lets you what rules you should follow. And the short answer is you follow the law of the country you're in. It has nothing to do with where the materials come from. You follow the law of the country in which you are doing your thing. Um, and so the, the opposite is true is that if you're an author in France, you follow France's copyright law for everything, right? So you follow the law for the country you're in. As Will said, um, 
we found two things in the code. One is that US, Canada, and to some extent the US, or the UK, but US and Canada have very closely aligned law for these things. Canada calls theirs fair dealing, but they're really very closely overlapping. So there's very little that you could do under US law that you couldn't do under Canadian law. There's actually some situations in which Canadian law is probably more permissive. Um, the other is that all countries have some law that deal with quotation, for example. So like all countries have law that covers using quotes and excerpts. Um, and I think there's a really important argument to not let the sort of very hypothetical edge cases restrict practice for the majority of cases, that you should do the stuff that you think is clear and legal in the US. Um, we think there's lots of reasons that many, if not most of the situations will be legal in other jurisdictions and just to be clear about what you are doing in that process. Um, we also think it's important from a sort of policy and advocacy standpoint to say, wait a second, like copyright is a tool for the dissemination of information, but we have to not let it sort of overwhelm all other fields of free expression, of education, that in fact, we should say, well, wait, if your copyright law doesn't let you do these core educational things, you need to update your law. In the same way that like for a period of time, it was not clear how DVRs were legal in many countries' copyright law because they just like weren't updated to deal with this modern thing. But people mostly accepted that like the law just needed to change because DVRs were a thing or cloud storage was a thing, right? Like they're like, yeah, we just need to update our law. And so I think it's important to not sort of cede all that space. And so these are the core practices we have to do to be effective educators. They're legal under fair use and we should advocate for them to be legal everywhere. Uh, just to refer to some questions, are there any questions people have about baseline copyright law? Questions about, um, you know, one of the things Will and I talk about a lot is how copyright law does not protect ideas, even really valuable ideas, even really individualized ideas. So you could come up, for example, with a really great framework for evaluating some student competency, right? And you were like, no, no, the things you really need to look for are A and B and C and D. And that's valuable and it's new, but the ideas are not ownable by copyright. And so one more place people get caught up, I think, is if they're trying to create their own materials, questions about attribution, where you might definitely need to attribute, oh, this is an evaluation framework from this author, or oh, this idea of how we teach the history of this event came from here. Those ideas can be valuable, but the value of the ideas as opposed to the written work is not what copyright protects. And so you can use those in your OER on whatever basis is the correct attribution professionally, but without having to worry about copyright problems. That's another area that's sort of, it's actually in the structure of copyright law, not really fair use itself, but that we talk about some in the code. I think that's a really important point. And, and to say the reverse is true as well. Something I've heard Peter say several times is that the code can give you the may you decision. You have to make the should you decision or not. There might be moments where you say, oh yeah, it's perfectly legal for me to include this traditional knowledge material or this private communication or this embarrassing communication. And you may say, but ethically, that's not the right answer for me. So you should never read the code as saying, you must include this. You have to include this. We demand it. You should always read it as saying, you have permission legally to make the best ethical, personal, pedagogical decision. But yeah, I would ask folks, I can't believe that there's no one on this call who's ever had a question about copyright. Um, and I would encourage you that no matter how big or small or dumb, you ask it. So do maps count as illustrations slash facts or are they separate? Maps are really interesting because they've been economically valuable for a long time. And so there have been a lot of sort of um, complicated back and forth about maps. Will, do you want to talk about that? Or do you? I'm, I'm happy to say a little bit that maps, if you go back to the original copyright law, maps are, maps are included very early on because of exactly that sort of economic value that you talked about. Um, and in fact, there, there is a phenomenon called paper towns where people, individual map makers will add individual fake 
towns or names into a map to try to catch people who have sort of ripped off the map in different ways. Um, so generally speaking, where there are creative elements, maps are protectable, but where they are simply factual depictions. So if I, if I used a drone to take a picture of something high up, that would not be protectable. But where it is more creative, it would be. Meredith, if I garbled that sufficiently, do you want to add nuance there? No. Um, what I will say with maps is they're one of the easy areas to say to, well, for two things, I think, where one is um, to think about your fair use purpose. Yeah. And the other is to um, think about your public domain alternatives. So, um, most person created maps have some copyright to them if they've been created recently enough to do that. Um, an exception, of course, is any maps created by uh, employees of the federal government in the course of their employment. Those are public domain by law. And then there are also um, lots of open map projects, open street map being the biggest one, but other open map projects. So that's your first question, which is like, does copyright affect this at all? And the answer is like, probably, yeah, unless it's made by the government or it's really old. It's technically something that is protected by copyright. And then you go like, do I need an open version? There are these open versions, but in what I'm doing is fair use, right? Something can be protected by copyright and still fair use. That's how, we, how it works. <laughs> so if, for example, um, you're looking at a map of uh, population change over time that was published in a newspaper to talk about migration from certain states to other states for the purpose of like the electoral college or whatever. And then you're using that in a civics book. That's where like the regular fair use analysis would come in. And you were saying, this is originally for a news <clears throat> purpose to talk about public events in this redistricting debate and I am using it to teach civics. And that would be a pretty standard fair use transformation. Um, so in many situations, the context in which you'd use a map in education is different than the, the, the purpose for which they were created. Um, and so they're totally eligible to fair use, but they're generally gonna be in copyright. Though also because depending on what purpose you're using it for, I think there, it can be easy to find you know, general maps that are in the public domain. And if you have a specific purpose, then that's where fair use comes into play. And that's actually a thing that we find oddly sort of the yin and yang of fair use, which is if you have a very specific reason, this is the one you need. That means it's more likely that you have an easy to enunciate purpose. I need this one because of this thing. And then you go, is that same teaching purpose why it was created? And you talk about your teaching purpose and you get into the fair use analysis. And if the answer is like, nah, really any map, so that's a good time to find a public domain one or a, an openly licensed one. Any other questions? Any cases that have just been uh, annoying you? Anything unrelated to OER about copyright that you have been wondering about? I have a case that I would like to ask about if we have time. Um, it's it's actually, it seems kind of like a slam dunk case to me, but um, the author is a little nervous about it. And I'll just say it's a medical department at our university. I don't want to put anybody on blast, but we have a project where somebody is um, developing a virtual reality environment for OER. And they're taking um, lots of different images from various sources. And um, a lot of these imagers were created in-house by the department. Some, in some cases, the copyrights for the images were transferred to publishers. Um, and in one case, several of the images are held by Elsevier, but the print resource in which these images appeared is out of print. Um, I think that the, the, the resource being developed meets all four factors. You know, it's, it's transformative. It's a virtual reality environment. The original images were appearing in print. Um, they come from a lot of different sources. Um, you know, they're, they're factual. These are like, you know, pictures of the human ear, you know. Um, I believe, you know, they're taken from a lot of different sources. So the amount is not substantial from any one particular source. I mentioned the, the books are mostly out of print. 
But the publisher in question that the, the author is very concerned about and their department is very concerned about is Elsevier. They're worried they're going to get sued, essentially. And so I'm wondering if that ever sort of comes into play. Like, do you ever say, ooh, you know, like the potential copyright claimant here might be, you know, a litigious one, you know? And so, I mean, does that ever kind of like come into the equation? And if so, like, how do you dispel that? So there's, a, there's like four or five really good questions wrapped up in there. Um, the first question is, Will and I always feel like our job is to start with what we think the law is, right? Not aspirationally what we hope it will be, like this isn't advocacy, and at the other end, not like a risk calculation. People may always take a risk calculation that is separate from what the code says, and that could be in either direction, right? You could be like, I don't know, man, haven't thought about fair use. I'm just making three copies on the Xerox machine. No one will ever know, right? That's not a fair use analysis. That's just like a risk analysis. And that's not a thing that we can predict for anybody. Um, the flip side is you might be like, I think this is fair use, but I do not want to fight with this gatekeeper or this whatever. So I'm not going to do it. I can just work around it. Also a risk analysis. Um, what I will say specifically here is... I think it's really important to differentiate the chance of Elsevier suing you from the chance of Elsevier writing you a nasty gram. Um, people often talk about getting sued, but I think it's really, really important to say that like people actually getting sued about mistaken fair use is vanishingly unlikely. There's actually a provision in the law that says if you are at an educational institution, a not-for-profit educational institution, some others that Will will tell you because he knows statute better than I do. Um, that your chance that you you're actually limited to real damages if you get sued for a good faith mistake and fair use. So you'd have to prove that actually they were going to make a huge amount of money selling this like random picture of ears in this case in which no one is ever buying this random picture of ears. And so your financial risk is actually super low in that situation. Secondarily, them suing you does not come without risk for them, right? Like right now, I have to sit here and give you this sort of like, well, these are the things we would think about, but there aren't really any cases. There's really few cases about these educational uses because no one sues over them because they know they're very, very likely to lose. Like if Elsevier sues a university, like actually goes like, I'm going to go to court and file the papers and I'm going to go through discovery and I'm not going to settle and I'm going to sue you and we're going to have a trial they can absolutely lose. They are very likely to lose. And that is why it's totally possible that Elsevier would write you a nasty note. And it is totally normal and even ethical legal practice for Elsevier's lawyers to write you a nasty note that says, this is illegal, you are breaking the law, this is copyright infringement, you are gonna owe us thousands and thousands of dollars. Even if in some different world, they were taking a copyright law exam and they knew that wasn't the answer they'd write down. Their job is to make an argument in that letter that is the best for their client. That letter does not have to be fair about what is likely, what is your case. And so it's a really hard thing because people in institutions are not used to doing that. But um, they actually have a huge risk to suing you because they might have a case that says, yeah, do what you want. Absolutely fair use to reuse images from... Uh, scholarly articles in teaching context, right? But like, great, everybody, cut and paste, go on with your lives. Um, but that's, it's a reason they don't sue. I will say in your analysis, um, transformation is generally a little better to be thought of as purpose to purpose, not format to format. So I think you're right that this is transformative, but it's transformative from the scholarly context in which you're saying like, this is a normal year. This is a year with swimmers year which is the like purpose of the scholarship that presumably Elsevier might own to the um, simulation, which is like teaching students about your structure. So that's your key transformation there, I think. And then I think the other last thing is like, the, your risk is low because this is really of low economic value to Elsevier. Like, they're never going to license this. 
but that's a case by case thing that you have to make. And it has to do with like, what's my real risk tolerance? And what's my tolerance for getting cranky letters? And there's nothing on earth that you can do that will keep you from getting cranky letters in all situations except doing nothing. And so it's really hard because I know a lot of people have very risk adverse gen general counsel and work like that, but like, it's a reason to start incrementally, right? Like you don't have to take the big steps right away, but I do think um, if OER gets sort of stuck in only doing stuff that can never be criticized, that leaves us with a very minimal space to operate. I think we've never seen anyone, as far as I know, Peter says this, and I haven't, I haven't been the project for its whole 20 years, I've only been involved for the last 10, but Peter Yazzi, a uh, professor emeritus of copyright law here at the law school and our senior collaborator has says that as far as he knows, no one has ever been successfully sued uh, for any fair use decisions made using the codes. And part of that is, is that if you're using the codes and you're thinking through the problems and even internally making some notes about like, this was my pedagogy and this is why I'm using it. It's just a vanishingly unrewarding situation for someone to sue you, right? They look mean and aggressive. They have a risk of losing. If you have a good faith thought out fair use argument at a not-for-profit educational institution, they can't really win anything. So there's a lot of structural stuff that if you're careful and think through um, why you're using it and how, that your risk is really pretty structurally low. Your risk of complaints is not, but your risk of um, actual consequences is. I mean, your risk of complaints is pretty low, but it, you can't totally manage for that. Just to underline, Meredith, what you said, which is exactly right, the last estimate I saw is it's about $278,000 to bring a copyright case in federal court. That's not to win the case, that's to start the case. Um, if you have 504c2, or if you're at a public institution where you have sovereign immunity, the maximum dollar amount they can win is zero or approaching zero. So their best case scenario is they spent many hundreds of thousands of dollars to recover zero dollars. Um, what they would be going for is the precedent, but exactly as Meredith says, they are just as likely to get a precedent that says it's fine to do that. We've all been through that with e-reserves, right? Oh no, that's terrifying, I can't do that. Oh no, actually, I can do that, it turns out, and now everybody knows it because the publishers paid a bunch of money to demonstrate to us that that's okay. They did that with accessibility too. And I would love if they did that with some other academic things. Meredith, go ahead. One thing I will say is we talk people in the code and elsewhere about thinking through um, your examples and sort of documenting your thought process. The only thing I will say there is to generally caution people. I think I love librarians. I love working with librarians. But sometimes people, I think, like, who like routine can sort of move towards checklists. And it is much, much better when you are doing your fair use analysis to do like a thoughtful narrative analysis for a set of similar uses where like you write two paragraphs about like all the photographs in that simulation, then to go in and be like transformative, check. Appropriate amount, check. Like, as you think through your work from both a making good choices and reducing risk standpoint, talking through your pedagogy, why are these good examples? Why are we using these ones? That is what will help you both make good choices and manage your risk. And writing down a sort of like checkbox legal analysis will not help you and does not help your legal risk. And if anything can make it worse. And so I will say, to the extent that you think about risk mitigation, it's having a really clear, really precise, why is this a good thing pedagogy answer and not like a, not having tried to write like a mini legal brief or how to like a legal checklist. Well, I'm impressed. 15 people have hung out 10 minutes past the hour. I'm, I'm happy. I will talk copyright all day forever. You um, should go. <laughs> but but yes, that's you may or may not want to do that. But anyway, I, I really appreciated the thoughtful questions and the good discussion. And thank you for having us too. It's such a nice invitation. Yeah, this was this was a super fruitful discussion, and we were really glad that you both could make it. Um, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for sticking around. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Thank you so much, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank all. you.